Live Online. Don Liberian Renaissance, putting you in the right frame of mind with the right attitude for national development. I come from the Ghana It's the Liberian Renaissance, changing minds, changing attitudes, a national platform revolutionizing a paradigm shift in our everyday life to make our country better. When people see us disjointed, they use that to divide us. The Liberian Renaissance, seeking a transformative Liberia positively. You find out that people speak negative. Reintroducing a new way of life for Liberia's change and transformation. This is very, very important. Join Dr. Lawrence Kamala Brooklyn every Tuesday at 6 to 7 p.m. for the Liberian Renaissance. Change your minds, changing attitudes. Dear friends, this is your program, the Liberian Renaissance. Only on ELBC 99.9 FM. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Greetings to all my mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. Greetings to my aunt Deng Somerville in Upper Buchanan. The Basa people call it Goza, and that is my birthplace. Even though my aunt Dink Somerville is visiting my brother Calvin Brockley in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, the United States. Greetings, dear friends, to my father's people on the beautiful shows of Grand Cess in Grand Crew County. Greetings to all of our taxi drivers, our pimp pimp rider, our push push riders, our market women and men, to our medical practitioners, to our teachers. Greetings, dear friends, to all of our silver servants, the ones who clean our streets. Greetings wherever you are throughout the length and breadth of Liberia or across the world. This is your program, the Liberian Renaissance. Changing minds aren't changing attitudes. Here we say not ethnicity, but nationality. Not individualistic attitudes, but rather the we consciousness. We the people residing in Liberia determined to make a constructive difference. I'm Larry Brappler, and today is yet another special edition of the Changing Minds and Changing Artists. You know, Liberia is a blessed nation, a nation whose people are gifted, dynamic, bravely intelligent, and have a heart of gold to help to change our world. Today's edition is featuring two wonderful medical practitioners, people who continue to give up themselves to help our nation move forward. They are not politicians. They're not aspiring for any government jobs, but they are ultra professionals who care about our nation and its people. I will start and ask each of them to self introduce, and then we will begin. And in the introduction, I will ask them to give a bit background about themselves, the upbringing, and the uh, the education and we will start with Dr. Kamo. That. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Brooklyn and Mr. LBC team. My name is Dr. Sovish Sanko Kamo. I'm a Liberian doctor. I was born right here in Monrovia. I'm a city girl. Um, went to school here in Monrovia, primary school the University of Liberia, and onward to the E.M. Doctority College of Medicine, where I earned my medical doctor degree. So I'm a clinical embryologist and a reproductive specialist. Thank you. Good introduction. Clinical em embryo embry embryologist. People will say, Dr. Brockler can't pronounce that word. That's strange. Uh, it's not a medical word. It's not even in the Bible. It's not a legal terminology. Dr. Hina. Hello. Uh, I just want to say thanks 
for the opportunity to be here. It is always a joy to be able to share some of the things that we do. Uh, I am Christiana Hina. Most people refer to me as Mon Chris, Mon Kwaise, or Dr. Hina. Uh, I was born in Maryland County, but was raised in Mangibi, which is Kakata or Kak City. My family, actually, my dad came from Lofa in a place called Nyende Moela Home. And so my primary education was in Kakata at St. Christopher School. And then the last four years I spent in Lofa on the Bola Home mission. Upon completion of that, I moved on to Cuttington where I spent three years studying biology. In 1980, I got a scholarship to further my education in the former Soviet Republic in a place called Krasnoda, where I spent seven years. I am a GP, three years of residency in Moscow at the second medical university. And then before going to the US, where I earned a degree in public health. So I am a GP and a public health officer. Excellent. And let me make sure I give full disclosure as a lawyer. Uh, Dr. Hina and I worked for the same organization, the General Board of Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church. I was the head of the Africa region and uh, she as well. Doc, what was your official title? I was the chief medical officer and a medical missionary for the General Board of Global Ministries for 24 years. Absolutely. And I served in Russia, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Tajikistan. All the cold countries. And I was proud always whenever we interacted at the Board of Global Ministers that uh, there was another Liberian highly qualified and giving service to God's people. Dr. Savich Sankor Kamo, can you tell us about your practice? Where do you, where is your clinic? And uh, what kind of practice are you in? And is it challenging? Is it a piece of cake? Um, tell us. So the practice is basically um, reproductive health with emphasis in infertility medicine. Mm. The clinic is located um, on Marshall Highway and it's called the New Beginning Fertility and Medical Center. So we cater basically to infertile couples, people that are having difficulties conceiving naturally. And also we have a demand from the community. So we also cater to maternal and newborn, you know, health conditions as well. And how are you finding it? Infertility treatment in, in Liberia is more like something new. Although it's not new to the rest of the world, but it's new to Liberia in a sense that this is the first time an IVF clinic has been established in Liberia. And mm. IVF, we mean in vitro fertilization. So at the moment, it takes a while, but a lot of those that have issues with infertility are becoming to know that, okay, yes, I can get help in Liberia, and this is where I can get help. But it takes a lot of awareness, you know, that people will understand that I... If I'm experiencing problems in getting pregnant, I can get pregnant still outside of the traditional or conventional way. Doc, this IVSF, a lot of people in our country uh, 
uh, a naysayers. Okay. Somebody cannot give birth. They say, quote unquote, they sold the womb. Exactly. Or the witch people did something, somebody put something in the stomach. Yes. Uh, how are you finding it? Is it, are people understanding that there is a possibility now or we still got to do some work to get them to understand it? So we still have a lot of work to do because there's still a majority of the population, of that population that believes that if it can happen this way, you know, with the traditional mindset, with all the myths, they still don't believe that science and biology has made it possible. Technology has advanced to the fact that it's possible that I, I mean, I can have a child even if I have these problems. So like I'm saying, it takes a lot of awareness. The few librarians who understand it basically are those who have been out you know, those who are actually accessing the internet or those who have seen it happen in other areas, in other countries. And they find it very interesting that, you know, here in Liberia, Liberia too has gotten on board with this scientific technology. So I get, um, most times when people come across me and I explain, this is what I do. A lot of people are surprised. You mean yeah. it's done here in Absolutely. Liberia? Absolutely. And I'm yes, yes. I'm like, yes, it's done here in Liberia. It's available. You know, you can access it here. You don't have to travel to Ghana. You don't have to travel to India, nor America or Europe. You can actually access it here. So it, if it is challenging, yes, it is challenging because it's a new thing. It's still in its embryonic stage. We're still like two years since the clinic has been open. Okay. It takes a lot of, you know, reaching out to people, reaching out to the communities, you know, and making people to understand that this is the way to do it. I know there are other, you know, beliefs. Mm -hmm. We have yeah, our traditional absolutely. beliefs, absolutely. we have our religious beliefs, but we have to bridge the gap. Once we're doing awareness, we have to bridge the gap there. And your clinic is called New Beginning Fertility and Medical Center. Yes, sir you actually do give people a new beginning. Um, you're located on Marshall Road. Yes. Two years you've been there. Two years you've been there. With, what can you say is the success rate of the practice so far? I know it's only been two years, but uh, are you bringing forth babies? I would say definitely yes. We are bringing forth babies. At the moment, over the past three years, we've had pretty close to 16 patients. And out of those patients, we've had almost seven success rates. Okay. And we are expecting our live births between the space of February to April of this year. So we do have, um, we, we currently are doing ANCs for those you know, success cases. Now what's ANC? ANC is antenatal <laughs> care. Okay. So what we refer to in Liberia as our big belly clinic. Okay. And then you got postnatal. Then we have the postnatal care. Yeah. Hmm. Great success rate, I must say. In such a short time. So we are getting there. Okay. And like we tell people most of the time, uh, it's like patients, you know, get, they are the ones that are encouraging others. So if a patient Tell comes the in, they are telling a story. They are the ones carrying their success stories to others. And others they have told come in either with relatives or friends. That's how the awareness is being created. Talking about telling the story, I had no idea. Not even an idea of, of what was happening. But former President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, talking about full disclosure, had mentioned both of you, you and Dr. Hina, uh, to me and uh, said, Larry, these doctors, these women are doing wonderful things. The program is widely listened to. You must bring them on to tell the story. And that's why you're here. Uh, and um, I, I am amazed, uh, pleasantly amazed uh, that you are here. We'll come back to you, uh, Dr. Kamal. Okay. Dr. Hina, 
you are a general practitioner, uh, years of experience in, in Russia, in America, um, Doc, in Kakata, uh, what's happening there? Uh, are you are you making the difference? Is because you know healthcare across this country, uh, we don't have enough of you medical doctors to serve uh, our population. Tell us about your practice, Doc. Well, uh, I will give you a little background to what I'm going to share. Uh, when I left the Board of Global Ministries in 2011, uh, I wanted to so desperately return to Liberia. I did not come with a bucket full of money, but I came with a heart to serve. And so I went to Kakata because Kakata was where I was raised. I had my father who passed away last year at mm. the age of 101. Oh my. And so I thought it would awesome. be the best place to start. And I was living in this house. Like I said, I didn't come with resources, but I did come with a heart to serve. And so one day I decided I was just going to set up this clinic in the yard from a makeshift uh, structure and see who comes. And so the first day I saw 10, 15, and the next day there were more than 50 coming from the street to form a line before the gate. And this was all, all free all the services provided was free. And so there were so many people from all walks of life, like uh, Dr. Kamo just said, uh, people pass on information to others. So it was never an advertisement on TV or anything, it was just by word of mouth. And people started coming, and I was the only person I couldn't do much. So I started hiring what we call community-based primary health care uh, staff. And so they came. I started training them in how to take blood pressure, how to stake fingers for blood, how to test for sugar. And so gradually, the ministry started to grow. There were so many people, we had absolutely no space in a yard. And why doing that? Uh, friends from the U.S., friends from around the world who I've worked with decided that something is happening and we want to be a part of this. And so they built for us the clinic that we have, which is called the Waterfield Primary Healthcare Center when we started, that is now upgraded to Waterfield Medical Center. Uh, but uh, the challenges of being in a rural area was just beyond anything I imagined. Mm, can imagine. Things that we will use where I worked, like antibiotics, uh, that could save the lives of people people were dying because they didn't even know you could use that to become healed. Hmm. And so the ministry started like that with all of these different people. We still provide uh, services to 90 villages and 33 around Kakata. Uh, since it's a primary health care uh, center, we reach out providing primary health care. And that's from the vaccines to the birth control methods to eye care to community dental health and now delivery. And the next phase is going to be the surgical because we do now have the surgical ward for that. So in all, uh, there has been challenges 
but it has been fun <clears throat> challenges because I've learned uh, from serving and it has also brought joy to those that I serve. Interesting. Dear friends, this is your program, The Liberian Renaissance, Changing Minds and Changing Attitudes. And today's edition, we've got two change makers, two medical doctors, Dr. Chris Hina and Dr. Savich Sankor Kamor, Liberian medical doctors who are doing wonders in our country. One is in Marshall, fertility clinic. The other one is a general practitioner dealing with children and adults. You're listening to the Liberian Renaissance, changing minds and changing art to the doctor. Come on, let me come back to you. Healthcare in Liberia is not cheap. Yet, you are offering services. Is it affordable? How are your, your patients getting through? So I will answer that question in two ways. I would say yes, it's affordable. I would say no, it's not affordable. So as you rightly said, healthcare is not cheap. And fertility treatment all over the world is expensive. So yes, there are couples who can afford. And for these couples, it's even cheap, so to speak, that they can have this service in Liberia. In Liberia, yes. <clears throat> As opposed to traveling, looking at the expense of air tickets, looking at the expense of hotel bills, and even commuting from hospital yes. to hotel. That cuts down a lot of the cost for them out of their entire you know, IVF journey. So yes, for those couples, it's much cheaper to have this service in Liberia. On the other end, I would say no, because fertility is expensive. Not everyone who has an infertility issue will be able to afford this. And that's where we have to be a little bit more, not political, but a little bit more appealing because there are other countries I know for sure in the UK where I did my specialty, the NHS comes in for a couple who's going for the first time for IVF. The NHS handles this, the cost for that couple. And then if you should go the second or third time, you have to pay off pocket. Now, we may not be able to reach at that level in Liberia. But if some form of subsidy can be given for those, you know, less, you know, for the economically low couples who too need that service, that would be a great help, you know, cutting down some of the costs for them so that they too can access that service. And, and that's where I was going next, uh, Doc, because I, I remember I went to the Methodist school in Buchanan where my mother was the principal, but I remember that every year the government of Liberia would give subsidy to the private school so that they would give books free for students and the subsidy will help uh, because it was for profit school to mm -hmm. help uh, other community children to come in. Considering the fact that infertility may be vast, widespread in our country, I think that idea is it's not a novelty. I think it is an idea whose time has come. Uh, exactly. Have you have you advanced this to the Ministry of Health in any way? Or <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm doing that now as we're speaking. So let me just give a little history of how I got into infertility. Mm -hmm. And that will kind of answer your question okay. for that, if I have advanced this at the Ministry of Health. So when I graduated from Dokiati, we had this mandatory training
listen, then I settle for that. But then I said to myself, I know what I want to do. So the medical director at the James David Hospital. Huh. In Pinsville. In Pinsville. So I was there and then I started to look out to see if I could get scholarship to do this post-grad studies. So I had gotten accepted into the University of Leeds in the UK, I but I couldn't afford the school fees. So then I went onward from place to place and I finally got to the Ministry of Health to see if I could solicit scholarship or funding for this course. Blessing it for me, after a period, I was able to get the funding scholarship through the World Bank grant to go to school. Through the ministry? Through the Ministry of Health. Okay. So I went to study and I came back. The first thing when I came back, before I left, I had to sign an MOU Absolutely. that once I get back into the country, I work for my country two years. I mean, I was willing to work even 50 years because the need is yes. there. Yes. So when I got back home, I went onward. And then if I went to get an assignment, you know, I'm back home. I'm back to work. And the first question, I'm not going to call names, mm -hmm. but the first question my immediate supervisor at the time said to me is, what, what are you going to do with what you have learned? Where would you fit? Where are you going to, I mean, how many people in Liberia will access that? And I'm like, wow, I've gone all this way. I've come back all these <laughs> Months the issue of, studying. of Doc, I'm not cutting off the <laughs> issue of infertility. Every it's Liberian like woman and man want to bring forth a child, and you are asking, what will you do with the acquired knowledge? And my supervisor then went on to say, This is why we tell you people when you are going to do postgrad studies, do something that the people will need. Oh my God. I'm like, okay. And at the end of the day, I went back, worked a few months at JFK, worked two years at Redemption, and I wasn't getting any support. Nobody seemed to worry about well, this population years, of people, so but I had done my on. two years. So I figured out, okay, if no one wants to help, I can help in my own way. And then I'm from a family background of medical people as well. My dad is a doctor. My mom is a nurse. I've spent my entire years in the hospital. So... It was a family thing we decided as a family. Since this is your dream, we'll help you push your dream. And that was how we opened the New Beginning Fertility Clinic. That's, That's where right. we are today. And we are putting smiles on people's faces. That's At least I found somewhere that someone needs the service. What am I going to do with that? We're doing something with it. <laughs> Excellent. Dear friends, you're listening to the Liberian Renaissance, Changing Minds and Changing Attitudes. Dr. Hina. Uh, same question. Are your services affordable? Considering that healthcare is not cheap. Yes. Uh, given what uh, Dr. Kamal has just said, you will have healthcare that will always be affordable for some and not for, and not for others. But in our context, when we talk about affordable, we would think it's affordable for all. For example, an eye care at our clinic, it's 250 Liberian dollar to register. All of the equipments that are used the manipulation that's done, the consultation, it's all free. But during the process, when you are diagnosed with, say for example, cataract, or you have glaucoma, or you have some other related eye disease, then you buy the drugs. And then it becomes a problem because people say, I can afford it. Others are so thankful that it is so affordable that they rush to get what they need. So 
Affordability has to be looked at in a context. In the context yeah. yeah, has to be looked at in a context. And so, yes, all of our services, I will say they're absolutely affordable. And the reason for that, when I was only in a second grade in Kakata, I lost my friend. And this friend parents told me and a group of kids in the class that their daughter Helen died because she was wished. And I thought at that age, second grade, that I don't believe she was wished. I believe she did not take her anti-malaria drugs because in my household, every Sunday, my, my father made us to take anti-malaria, even though there were reaction to the anti-malaria where our whole body itch, but he did not know that was reaction from there, and he made us to take it. So that was what brought me into saying, I will become a medical doctor so that I can save all the kids in my community. But I was just in the second grade. Mm. But I pursued that until I was in the ninth grade. My first medical uh, uh, employment was at the maternity center here in Monrovia. On the bypass. The bypass. I was in the ninth grade. But instead of introducing me into medicine, they made me the janitor in that maternity center. So while I was doing my janitorial service, one doctor, Patricia A. Devine, Divine, Dr. Devine, yes. saw me and said, I see you scrubbing the floor every morning. What are you doing here? Who are you? And I told her I want to become a doctor. And that's why my father sent me here. And she kind of gave me this big smile. She said, if you want to become a doctor, this is not where you belong. Mm. So tomorrow, come with me. So I went with Dr. Divine, my ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. Just going with her, she introduced me to surgery, to delivery, to all these things. And from there, I just continue that heart of wanting to come back and serve. So when you talk about affordability, I understand a lot when these people say, I don't have the money, I can't afford and this group say, I have the money, I can afford. So that's where we come in as health professionals and uh, give our service. And so that's what I do. And I enjoy it. Great. We're having a fascinating conversation with two of Liberia's brightest and big heart ladies who are helping to change our country through the healthcare delivery system. Dear friends, you're listening to the Liberian Renaissance, changing minds and changing attitudes. Dr. Kamo, let me come back to you. Um, what are the plans? What, are, what plans do you have to expand, for example? Uh, you've been in business now two years, but this, I can tell you, for example, I'm from Grand Bassa, and I know that the need is so huge. Uh, any, any, not maybe immediate, but any plans to expand to the other counties? That's a good question, Doc. Um, we do have plans of expanding, but before we come to the expansion portion, I have a desire to train. Okay. Because Dr. Kamor cannot be in every county at the same time. But if I have others with interest, like maybe young Ruben here, he's, you he's know, starting to be a medical he's doctor. He's starting to be a medical doctor. If I have other doctors or other, you know, health practitioners that are interested, they can be trained. And with the training that you have, you know, you can be sent out. You know, we can deploy them. Medicine it's theory, but it's heavily apprenticeship. So if you get, you know, the training and the practice, then you can go on and further to get, you know, the training, I mean, the theory. But 
the expansion has to be first with empowering people. Exactly. Yes. And 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 gradually, incrementally, you can't just uh, get out there. You can't just get out it, it, it's, because it's you you, to... you have to consider the resources, and, you know, and all that. So, talking about young Ruben uh, Dolly, Ruben is a young man that I am grooming on the Changing Minds and Changing Attitudes program, and. He's a biology major. He wants to be a medical doctor. Uh, and he has a question for, uh, for the both of you to, to try to, to answer. So, uh, Ruben, uh, it's your time to ask Dr. Hina and Dr. Kamo your question. Greetings to the Pitch Valley citizens of Vama, Liberia. Greetings to the Zongen Town Do District, where my grandmother Lucy there resides. He never forgets his grandmother. Well, one well, <laughs> greetings, Dr. Hene and Dr. Kamal. I'm honored to meet both of you on this platform today. And my inspiration is to become a medical doctor. I'm so excited to meet you both and to ask you this question now, Dr. Kamal. In what way do you believe your sacrifices as a doctor? have positively impacted the healthcare system and community in your nation. And that's that's for both of them to answer, right? That's one great. at a time. Okay. So Ruben, I would say one of the greatest satisfaction that I have is if I have a patient, sometimes I, you know, I forget everyone that I come across. But there are times when you go somewhere and then at some place and then you see a patient that says, you know, speaks to you or, you know, greets you, Dr. Kamo, hello. And then I'm like, Okay, hello, where do I know you from? Oh, you don't remember me? And they start to, you know, recall the story. And then you're like, oh, yes, I remember. And that story is good, you know. And that story, it puts warmness in my heart. I'm like, yes, I'm making an impact. So that's one way in which I know that the sacrifices that I'm making, you know, people are appreciating it. And there are more stories, more, more, more stories like that. Dr. Hina? Uh, likewise, uh, it's always a joy when you're walking, especially in our part of the world, Cock City, and uh, you come across people, whether they were from the Muslim background, whether they were from Lofa, whether they were from India, whether they were from wherever, stop you and say, hi, Doc, and you kind of give them mm. this kind of look like, where do I know this person from? And they say, oh, you don't remember me? Like, uh, how did we meet? Oh, remember my mother was dying and you oh, did yes. so and so? Remember my baby was dying that time? Remember, and you just like, remember, remember, remember. And uh, when you think about it, even though those people didn't pay you anything, but it is so fulfilling. It is such a reward that uh, I didn't think they would even remember what was done. I don't remember it because there's so many. Like I said, I've been back since 2012. We go into villages, we go into towns, we're at the clinic. And so when people call me Mom Chris, it's like, okay, Mom Chris, all right. Dr. Hina, Mama Koise. And then they begin to tell you the stories. I think that's the impact we are having, both for her and for me. That's a huge impact for a mother to say, my baby was dying, and you did this, and you did that. And so thank you. I think that's the impact we all should desire. Excellent. Dear friends, I'm having a ball. Well, two of Liberia's best, and uh, they are telling the story. They are changing their communities one day at a time. Now, we will open the lines very shortly uh, for people who have got interest. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the master uh, controller. Uh, but before we, we, we do that, I, I just want to go around just, just, just one more time. Uh, Dr. 
come up. Are you the only known uh, embryologist uh, or fertility specialist in Liberia? So as at this moment, um, I'm the only known embryologist. I do know there were some Liberian doctors who were sent um, at the University of Southern Wales. I'm not sure. I don't know if they have finished their studies, but I'm the only clinical embryologist, a reproductive specialist at the moment. You're certainly the pioneer. Yes, I'm the pioneer. Congratulations. Thank I mean, you. I think that's I think that's great. Dear friends, this is your program, the Liberian Renaissance. Changing minds are changing attitudes. Yeah, we say not ethnicity, but nationality, not individualistic attitudes, but rather the we consciousness. We the people residing in Liberia determined to make a constructive difference. I'm like abruptly, as I said, I've got Dr. Kamo and Dr. Hina here on this platform. We're going to open the lines uh, and uh, you can have a chance to call. Uh, and uh, our number is, uh, hang on folks, I, I, I do this every Tuesday and now I have to remember what the number is. So you can call us now on 088 zero five four five one four zero 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 eight eight zero five one four zero nine six zero eight eight zero five one four zero nine six those of you who have my private coordinates i uh, grant you the opportunity to call me on those numbers 0880514096. Call us and we'll get you to the line. So, uh, Dr. Kamor and Dr. Hina will be able to answer any of the questions that you have. And so, you know, if you're in Kakata or nearby in Kakata, you've got an excellent clinic to go to uh, the Waterfield Medical Center. And if you're in Dwazan or Habel or any part of Liberia, actually, and you have infertility issues, you can come to Marshall and uh, clearly you will be served by at the New Beginning Fertility and the Medica Center. So call us on 0880-514096 or use my private numbers and you will be able to get through to us and uh, our doctors will be able to to answer. Uh, Dr. Hina, did you, well, I think you did say you knew when you were a child that you wanted to be a, a, a medical doctor, correct? Correct. And it's because of your your friend, uh, when Helen. You, Helen. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Helen is smiling. Where, where she is. Uh, Dr. Kamo, did you have that same dream as well, wanting to be a medical doctor as a child? I've always wanted to be a medical doctor. Um, like I said, I grew up in a family of medicine. So I was always with my dad in JFK or in the Catholic Hospital. So from the now early I know, 80s... Now I know your family. <laughs> from the early 80s, it was JFK Medical Center. Yes. And there was this one doctor that I admired the most. She was a Ugandan doctor. And growing up as a child, I always had this tooth problem. My dad would say, I would take you to Dr. Eugene. I would take you to Dr. Eugene. So I was always at the dental clinic at JFK. It's out of doing a filling or pulling out my, my tooth. So every time I went there, she was so nice to me. And then even though she would be like numbing and, you know, extracting, but she would, at the end of the day, she would give me a, a lot of pop. So I say, if this is the way you know, doctor is, I think I want to be a doctor. I want to be like <laughs> Dr. Eugene. <laughs> so I've already had that dream that I wanted to be a doctor. And then, of course, my dad was an inspiration over the years as well. Okay, let's take this call. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Give us your name and let's talk. You're very low. Yes, sir, but we're not hearing you with clarity. Uh, 
can you please call us again? Hang up and try again. Please. The, the line is very bad. 0880514096 or 0886546166. 0886546166. Call us on both of those numbers and you will be able to get through. You know, children, we children, we, we are products of, of, of our parents sometimes. My father was a lawyer and a United Methodist minister. Uh, I had no desire to be a minister. Uh, I, I came out being a minister of the gospel and a lawyer. So I think we, we, what we see our parents or, our, you know, or family members do, we, we try to, we try to follow. 0880514096, 0886546166. Hello. The lines are bad. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please just use 0886546166. I will, I will get you through. That is a, a number for a friend of mine, uh, 0886546166. Callers, I know the interest is very high in getting through to these wonderful professionals in the medical field in Liberia. Uh, doctor, let me see. I think this is a call that's coming. I hope. Hello. Yes, good afternoon. Yes, sir. Yes, Give sir. us your name and let's talk. Okay, my name is Alexander Bafo, and I'm calling from Mount in my United. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, firstly, I would like to thank the studio guests for the achievement. And I am an incoming daddy, and I also want to know. If uh, there's a possibility for a woman to be barren, and what causes a lady to be barren? Because I have a family who normally see her men, at, but it's not um, regular, and since then she has been facing some issue. She hasn't experienced pregnancy. So I think by getting clarity from here, I think it will be of help for her. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Kamal. We will answer that. You can listen. Uh, Doc, you want to attempt it? If we get a call, we'll, we'll, we'll put it through. Okay. So, um, good evening to that caller. And I'll try as much as possible to answer your question that you can understand me. I mean, not to put so much medical jargon in it. Now, it is possible for a woman to be barren. There are many, many, many factors, you know, that will cause a woman to be barren. The major factors that we have in this part of our world... And I would say this is because for us in the developing countries, it's basically the infectious diseases. Mm. So one of the major reasons why a woman will be unable to conceive is because she has blocked fallopian tubes. This takes pretty close to 25 or 30 percent of the infertile cases that we see. So these tubes are blocked because of, you know, STDs and STIs that, you know, the lady had contracted previously, they were partially treated or they weren't treated at all. And at the end of the day, the infection, you know, ascends to the tubes and then it blocks the tube. Now, blocked tubes will never give you any symptom as opposed mm. to a little... So you wouldn't really pain. know. You might not know. Most people get to know that they will have blocked tubes when they are trying to conceive after a time and then it's not happening and then they try to seek medical care. Then they are asked to do the SCG or the warm X-ray, and then you discover that you've had black tubes all along. That's one in way in which... So you nobody know, wished you, you got black tubes. Nobody has wished you, you just have blocked fallopian tubes. Another way in which a woman may be barren or one of the causes may be due to, in I mean, unbalanced hormones. Hormones are the chemicals our bodies will make when we are in our reproductive years. She may have problems with her hormones. They aren't balanced. Those are the chemicals responsible for when she menstruates, how her menstrual cycle is, what her flow is like, whether she's ovulating or not. And when we say ovulating, whether she's able to release the eggs or not. That's another way in which, and that we cannot know until we do several tests. Other ways in which sometimes, a lot of the time, people, you know, kind of think it's just a woman's thing. Of course, there are fibers or masses yeah, or growth, say, yeah. you know, that are in a uterus and depending on locations, they may stop you from conceiving. 
But one thing that people leave out is the male factor. Yeah, some of us men... Exactly. We get problems. A lot of the time, people think, even the woman herself, she's made to believe that fertility, pro infertility problem is just her. Some of the men that became bad men, or they will say, that Thank me, you. That, I, that I may get problems. And 50% of the time, studies and data have shown that males, 50% also are the cause of infertility. Now, let me take this call, this person, Ben and Ho. Hello? Oh, I think I lost him. Okay, please, go on. So to answer your question, sir, it's both male and female factor. So to say a woman is barren, she has to be checked. Her husband or her partner also has to be checked. Yeah, and we can't just assume that she's barren. It yes. could be something that may be blocking the fertility. It may not exactly. be permanent. Uh, and so you see, so this is this is this is quite 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 helpful. Um, Dr. Hina, I, I, what are some of the cases that you treat? I know you're a general practitioner, but you've been in the business for so long. What are some of the, the well, cases that you <clears throat> treat that are a bit complicated? We treat some of the very cases that ecologists called in. And before, we didn't have a place to send them. So if I discover a woman or a male who may be having that uh, situation, I have a place now to refer them, and that's to Dr. Kamo. And so I usually refer them there because she has the facility and the more detailed testing. Uh, we do see uh, a lot of STIs, uh, STDs. We see HIV. And uh, we also... Adult sexually transmitted. transmitted. Mm -hmm. Infection and yeah. sexually transmitted diseases. disease. Yeah. All right. Just and, for, for my listening audience. Yeah. And uh, sometimes we see a lot of fungus, uh, both in kids and in adults. Uh, now we're beginning to experience what the West has been experiencing for a long time. We see a lot of diabetic cases mm. and a lot of uh, hypotensive cases. So those were things before we thought, oh, Africa is just infectious, but now they're turning into what you see in the West and also hot conditions. And and we, we have to wrap up now, but talking about hypertension, you know, a lot of people will, 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 will be hypertensive. They will not know. They will get up in the morning. They will eat. They will talk. They will hug the people. They'll fall out and die and they say, the person who are not sick, somebody wished them but they've never been able to check. This is fascinating. We have to do part two to this because there is a high interest. We have problem with our phone lines and uh, we don't have enough time. I will go around the table now. Let me start with Dr. Hina uh, to just wrap up. Well, I'd like to say thanks for having us. I hope this was meaningful to meaningful. the listeners and uh, also to us, because we learn from some of these things as we begin to speak it out. And I'd like to thank uh, Madam Sirleaf for making this possible for us. I'd like to thank all of the supporters that we have at Waterfield Primary Healthcare Center and Medical Center now for all of the all of the support that we have received from them. And I also want to thank Dr. Kamo for her commitment to service in this country. Because as a young person, I'm much older now. As a young person, I can see how motivated she is. Yes. And I just want to say thanks to all of you. To you, uh, Larry, it's good to see you again yes. after so many years. Dr. Savish, come on. Okay, first and foremost, I would like to say thanks to Madam Salif. Okay, she... <laughs> initiated this, although I tried to shy away from it. You but did, you did. I didn't let you. <laughs> I'm happy that we had this opportunity and I'm thankful to you, Dr. Brooklyn, and your ELBC team as well. And then to the public as well. I'm thankful that, I mean, some people have listened and I'm hoping that all we have discussed here today or you've heard here today is something that you're going to, you know, give a thought to that infertility is not a woman's thing, as we Absolutely. all think. Absolutely. It's a man and a woman's thing. If a woman is infertile, 
It's the man, it's the woman. Great. Right. Okay, Two wonderful medical practitioners. This program will be repeated on Saturday at 4 p.m. I've been Larry Brockler. Until next time, be an agent of change. So long. Development. I come from the Ghana. It's the Liberian.